But um, he's going up through purgatory, then goes to the Terrace of Envy. Uh, the eyes of sinners there are sewn shut because they look upon others' things and they envy. So here their eyes are sewn shut. They've been looking too closely at things. Um, uh, then they move through the Terrace of, of Sloth, or anger first, I guess, anger. Terrace of Anger, this is where Dante learns the lesson about love, the main lesson of the Purgatorio. Uh, he encounters a, uh, an angry man, and he tells him uh, about the nature of, of, of anger. He goes through the Terrace of Sloth. There, the sinners are in perpetual motion. Like those who are s slothful or lazy, sleepy. Think of the book of Proverbs where it's, it's talking about the sluggard, the lazy person. You know, look at the ant. Do like the ant. Work hard. Be busy. Here, the punishment for sloth is to be in perpetual motion. You gotta, you're, they're running. They're, do, they're running around a track. <laughs> Learning to be active, being active in their virtue, not just avoiding evil, but doing working for good. So they overcome it that way, and so on and so on. I won't go through all of the cantos here. Um, but come up to the uh, top of Mount Purgatory. Uh, actually, I'm not going to get there. I'm going to do the 30, 30th canto. Uh, what did I do here? No, it's this. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. It's the virtual Dante that I want. Sorry. Which was where? No, no. Oh, there it is. So 30. Here in the 30th canto, he, Beatrice appears. So this is in the Garden of Paradise. At this point, Beatrice appears and Virgil disappears. And it's introduced through three quotations. Um, Line 11. No, that's too big. There's a hymn. Veni, sponsa di Libano, three times. And all the others echoed him, just as the blessed at the final summons will rise up when Christ returns and the sins, the, uh, the uh, dead rise from the graves. Each out of his grave, singing with new clothed voices, Alleluia, so from the godly chariot eternal life's messengers and ministers arose. One hundred stood ad vocem tanti senis. All, th all of them cried, Benedictus qui venis, and scattering flowers upward and around, manibus o date de lilia plenis. Okay, so there's a, the, the line 11 is from the Song of Solomon. Uh, verses 18 and 19 references to uh, Christ and the th uh, verse 21 is taken from the Aeneid Manibus. Uh, so um, Dante feels bereaved. What happens? Well, Dante, as I say, Virgil disappears. I turned. Okay, so hold on, hold on a second. Sh he sees this figure. A woman showed herself to me. Above a white veil, she was crowned with olive boughs. Her cape was green. Her dress beneath flame red, white, green, red, represent, representation of the three theological virtues, faith, hope, love. First Corinthians 13, right? He sees this woman, who is it? It's Beatrice. She represents God's love. Yes. 30. Canto 30, but it's in purgatorio. It's not in your, right? So within her presence, I had once been used to feeling, I had once been used, it's that girl he loved when he was a boy, that girl, but now she's a woman. But it's, it's her, I had once been used to feeling trembling, wonder, dissolution, but that was long ago, still through my soul. Now she was veiled, could not see her directly by way of hidden force that she could move. I felt the mighty power of old love. So the thing that's been motivating the whole canto or the whole of the Commedia was this love. He feels that old love, but now he understands it differently. It's veiled. It's not clear to him. Even still, he still needs clearer vision. 
and she's going to give it to him because now he's going to have to make the hardest ascent of all. He's going to have to ascend into paradise and she's going to lead him there. But she says, I turned around, but as soon as that deep force that is of her face and her love that's moved him struck my vision, the power that when I had not yet left, my boy had already transfixed me, I turned around into my left. Telling here, by the word, the way in Latin, the word left is sinister. It's a bad thought. He turns away from the blessing of Beatrice to something that can't lead him to blessing to uh, Virgil. He turns to his left just as a little child afraid or in distress will hurry to his mother anxiously to say to Virgil, I am left with less than one drop of blood that does not tremble. I recognize the signs of that old flame. That's, those are the very words that were used by Dido in the Aeneid when she encountered Aeneas. Right? Her husband Sicius had died. And yet when she sees Virgil, uh, or rather Aeneas, she feels the signs of the old flame in her. She lusts after him. She wants him, but she's, uh, she's vowed not to. Well, now he's referring it, the old flame, the thing that he just got rid of, but now it's coming back. And he's afraid. What's he afraid of? He's afraid of that he's not saved. He's, he's terrified, so he goes, turns to Virgil. But Virgil had deprived us of himself. Virgil, the gentlest father, Virgil, he to whom I gave myself for my salvation. And even all our ancient mother lost was not enough to keep my cheeks, though washed with dew. Remember, they were washed right at the outset. Uh, from darkening again with tears. And then a voice speaks. Dante, though Virgil's leaving you, do not yet weep. Do not weep yet. You'll need your tears for what another sword might may must yet inflict. Just like an admiral who goes to the stern and proud to see the officers who guide the other ships encouraging their task, so on the left side of the chariot I turned around when I'd heard my name, which of necessity I, I transcribe here, I saw the lady who had first appeared to me beneath the veils of the angelic flowers look at me across the stream. Though the veil she wore down from her head, which was encircled by Minerva's leaves. Minerva is Athena. It's a Roman uh, name for Athena. She's got the leaves of wisdom. This is godly wisdom now. This is not the Odysseus's. This is Minerva's leaves. And did not allow her to be seen distinctly. Her stance regal and disdainful, she continued. Just as one who speaks but keeps until the end the fiercest parts of her speech. Look here, for I am Beatrice. I am. How were you able to ascend the mountain? Did you not know that man is happy here? My lowered eyes caught sight of the clear stream, but when I saw myself reflected there, my, such shame weighed on my brow and my eyes drew back and towards the grass. Just as mother, a mother seems harsh to her child, so did she seem to me at first. He, he hears condemnation in her voice, even though she means him well. She, he, this is how he hears it. And how bitter is the savor of stern pities. Her words were done than the angels. In te domine sperabi, in you, O Lord, we, have, we will hope. But they're singing, do not go past pedes meos, my feet. And so forth. On he goes and upwards and so forth. But now Dante, uh, having gone through the seven terraces, must give an account for himself to Beatrice. And he, he does this in the last three cantos of the Purgatorio, but let me go on to the Paradise. Sorry, I told you it's a whirlwind tour here. Uh, and I'm going to do that and begin with, get rid of that now, if I can get rid of that. This picture, see this here? This is called a rose window. These rose windows are, were built in the Renaissance period um, in cathedrals throughout Europe. And when you enter into a, one of these ancient cathedrals, you will see these huge rose windows. They're in, if the, um, in, in Paris, the uh, cathedral that was just torched um, has a rose window in it. Same in Durham where I studied in university, likewise, it's same sort of Romanesque period. And in that, there's depicted 
uh, there are 12 panels here, the 12 apostles or the 12 disciples surrounding some sort of figure in the, mi in the, in the, in the middle. Well, and sometimes it's a, it's a Trinitarian figure, sometimes it's um, Christ. But here, in, this is what Dante has in his mind's eye. So when you enter the cathedral, what you're looking at is where you will ultimately be. So you're going into a church to worship God. Well, this one day you will look upon God in this way. That's how it's portrayed in the, in the book of Revelation, right? There are those, the 12, who are bowing down and worshiping the, the Christ, right? So that's how it's depicted. And this is where uh, Dante is now moving as he goes to heaven. This will be the, the final vision he sees is of something like a, a rose window. Uh, and I will read about that in Canto 31 then. I just wanted to give you a picture of that. So there's another variation. I mean, you see a figure in the center here. So Canto 31, okay. So in the shape of that white rose, the holy legion was shown to me, the host that Christ with his own blood had taken up as his bride. Oh, by the way, when he's ascending here, I should have said this, he's ascending here, he is going up, no longer up purgatory, but up from the earth through the spheres. He's moving up towards the out, outermost, the prima mobile, the heaven of heavens on the outside. So he goes up from the earth uh, to Venus and Mars and Jupiter and so forth. He's going up and he's ascending and he's going into the, going up to heaven, which is on the outside of all things. So he's going up, but he's also going, from our vantage point, going out into outer space, right? But from Dante's perspective, he's not only going up, he's going in because he's going to the eternal city. So this is why geography is sort of problematic. Because when we think, we think we think we're at the center of things and it would be going up would be also to be going out. That's not the way he sees it. We're on the outside of everything that is good and holy and solid and real and substantial and will never change, namely God and the, the heavenly Jerusalem. We're outsiders, we're going in. So he's going further up and further in as C.S. Lewis describes it in the Narnia Chronicles. That's what's happening here, right? So we're outside the walls of the heavenly Jerusalem and now he's going up towards that to see this beatific vision up these spheres and you can see this in in various forms so i'll just leave that at, at that for now and i'll leave you with a prettier image than this it's that's good enough but i said canto uh, 30 where did i leave it there so the shape of the white rose the holy legion was shown to me the host that christ with his own blood had taken us taken as his bride the other host, which flying sees and sings the glory of the one who draws its love, and that goodness which granted it such glory, just like a swarm of bees, that at one moment enters the flowers, and at another turns back to that labor which yields such sweet savor, descended into that vast flower graced with many petals. Then again rose up to the eternal dwelling of its loved, their faces were all living flame, their wings were gold, and for the rest their white was so intense, no snow can match the white they showed. Because this is not a, a white like snow. Remember the white is described even in the book of Revelation as being like snow. But it's whiter than that because it's a moral purity. There's a whiteness beyond white. And when they had climbed onto that flowering rose from rank to rank, they shared that peace and ardor which they had gained. They've gained in love. So the, the purpose of this Christian life is, uh, when you're Christians, is to know God better, to love him more, to love your neighbor better. That doesn't stop when you enter paradise. It's a continual change from glory into glory a continual ardor of flame and as you know more about the endless riches of God and his nature you, you it becomes more intense more delightful it's a process that begins in this life it does not end in this life anyway so that and that's what he's describing here they're they're being drawn and further always further in because the light of God so penetrates the universe according to the worth of every part that no thing can impede it 
This confident and joyous kingdom thronged with people of both new and ancient times turned all its sight and ardor to one mark. It's all oh threefold. And, and in response to this, he has to praise. So oh threefold light that in a single star sparkling into their eyes con con contents them so. Look down and see our tempest here below. If the barbarians, when they came from a region that is covered every day by Hellas, who wheels with her beloved son, the sun god, Helos, were, were seeing Rome and her vast works struck dumb when of all mortal things the Lateran was the most eminent, then what amazement must have filled me when I to the divine came from the human, to eternity from time, and to a people just and sane from Florence came. Because Florence is described as a, a crazy place now. Remember, I began with the uh, fresco of Dante referring to Florence, but it's not the Florence of his day. It's the eternal Florence. It's the eternal city. Every city on earth is to be like the city of God. They're supposed to make it like that. But just in case you were thinking that he was only talking about politics, he's not talking about politics. He's talking about how the Christian faith ought to uh, instruct politics. It's not about winning a political debate or winning political power. It's about becoming more godly. And he says, and certainly between the wonder and the joy, it must have been welcome to me to hear and speak nothing. And as a pilgrim in the temple he had vowed to reach, renews himself, he looks and hopes he can describe what it was like. So did I journey through the living light, guiding my eyes from rank to rank along a path, now up, now down, now circling round. And there I saw faces given up to love. Let me come to the conclusion of this because we are right on our, the home straight here. Uh, in Canto 33, so this is the last, very last canto, and very difficult to understand. It's a, the, the beatific vision, it's the blessed vision. That in Christian terms, it's the direct contemplation of God. We now, we see him as a, in the glass darkly, but then face to face. This is the face to face bit. And he, he tries to describe it in language and he fails, really. It's an indescribable thing, but then he goes on to try and describe it. But the, uh, the, the, the blessedness here, and at this point, gr there are, there's a blessedness granted to the, s the saints and those who are successful in the uh, contemplation. And there's a uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, Clairvaux prays here. And he prays to the Virgin Mary. Many of the cathedrals in this age were dedicated to Bernard of Clair Clairvaux and a, and a special uh, vision. And he, he prays that the Virgin Mary will allow Dante the final vision of God, and she grants it. And this is the final mystery that he has to penetrate <coughs> through the Virgin Mary, who's the source of the incarnation. Uh, there's a, a, and man's link to God through the, the God-man Jesus. The creator becomes a child of man as well as the son of God. There's that, he has those two natures. And so he's drawn in here, <coughs> and an image is described which he can't describe. So I'll come to that. I'll give you the undescribed, indescribed, 94 lines, 94, 96. He says, it, he says, that one moment brings more forgetfulness to me than 25 centuries have brought to the endeavor that startled Neptune with the Argo's shadow. I can't, it's impossible for him to describe what he sees. But he says, whoever sees that light is soon made such that it would be impossible for him to set that light aside for another sight. Because the good, the object of the will is fully gathered in that light. Outside that light, there, what there is perfect is defective. There's no comparison to this light that he's describing. So he can't even convey it to us because we haven't seen it. Every good that we can imagine is, fails in the comparison. And in the end, he says, how incomplete is speech, how weak, line 121, when set against my thought. And this to what I saw is such to call it little is too much. And then again, another prayer, eternal light. You only dwell within yourself and only you know you, self-knowing, self-known. You love and smile upon yourself 
And then that circle he sees, and he sees something like an image within that, a human effigy suited with the circle and found place in it. And my own wings, I'll conclude this, my own wings were far too weak for that. But when my mind, then my mind was struck by light that flashed and with this light received what it had asked. So the vision he saw. But here force failed my high fantasy. But my desire and will were moved already like a wheel revolving uniformly. So within that uh, circle where they're all moving and worshiping and loving God, he says he was moved by a love, the love that moves the sun and the other stars. So now he concludes with that word again. So love moves everything, including the planets, every other thing, including the constellations. But everything is moved by love, but now it's pure love. It's not misapplied love. It's not fallen love. It's pure love. And he sees that, and, and then he, that's the end of the Commedia. Anyway, I, as I say, a whirlwind tour. I apologize for such quickness. We'll move on now to Beowulf next class, the English, great English Anglo-Saxon epic.